to those who are joining us on the live stream as well. It's great to be together this way in person and online. We're just going to run through a song that we'll be using during our time together this afternoon, which is called Christ Our Hope in Life and Death. Just raise your hand if you, if you know that song, you're familiar with that one, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death. Brilliant. We're just, we'll keep our seats as we just run through that, just to refresh our memory or to learn that together, to enable our, our praise and worship to the Lord this afternoon.
Well, why don't we join our voices together with the words of that great hymn, How Great Thou Art, as we look to him who is worthy of all our praise, worthy of all our thanks.
my soul. Then it sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then it sings my soul. Thank you. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my tremendous privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Maiden family to this special service of thanksgiving. Whether you are here in the tent in Keswick, whether you're watching by live stream, or you're watching by catch-up, we are delighted that you're here as we celebrate and give thanks for the life of our esteemed brother, Peter Maiden. Many people have traveled long distances to be here. Let me please acknowledge Graham and Linda Wells and Todd Laba, who've come from Atlanta in the United States. Jill Waller, a former PA of Peter's, has come from New Zealand. And we're especially honored to have OM International Director Lawrence Tong, who's come from Singapore. Their desire to be here demonstrates the immense regard in which Peter was held. Two years ago, past Thursday, God graciously promoted Peter to glory. Calling home a faithful and devoted servant of the gospel, he was welcomed into heaven to hear the Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. Today, we come together to celebrate Peter's life and work, one of Cumbria's most famous sons and a mission leader to the world. It was my privilege to know Peter for more than 50 years. In fact, the entire life uh, time of his full-time Christian ministry. As a young man, Peter gave up secular employment in Carlisle to serve with the Open Air Mission, and his first assignment was to the church I attended in the northeast of England. I'm honored to have been his friend for more than five decades. Peter's life was characterized by great humility, marked by outstanding integrity, exemplified by a love for others, and defined by a passion for world ministry. When the history of world mission for the last 50 or 60 years is recounted, the names of George Verwer and Peter Maiden will be writ large. Peter's involvement in the Lord's work has been extensive. Operation Mobilization, the Keswick Convention, Cape and Ray, Hebron Evangelical Church, Bethany Hospital in India, to name but a few. His influence in the Lord's work has been pervasive as an outstanding preacher and Bible teacher, as well as church and mission leader. His inspiration to a younger generation of leaders in the Lord's work has been far-reaching as a recruiter for world mission, a trainer, and a mentor. But above all, Peter was a family man. His love for Wynn, their children and grandchildren was steadfast, and his greatest desire was that they would all fall in love with Jesus and serve him all their days. To Wynn, to Tim, Becky and Dan, their families and the wider Maiden clan, we would all express our heartfelt condolences today. We can only imagine what a huge gap Peter's passing has made in the family circle. We assure you of our continued support and prayers. We're grateful to the Keswick Convention for facilitating 
this event today and for all those who behind the scenes have made this possible. As you know, Keswick was a major feature of Peter's life and it's appropriate that we're here this afternoon. I'd like you to invite you to stand if you're able and we're going to pray and then Colin and the band will lead us in the first song, the song chosen by Peter himself. Shall we stand? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving and praise. You are a great God and worthy of our adoration. We thank you for Peter. We thank you, Peter, was part of our lives. We thank you for his ministry, which impacted millions of people around the world. As we bring you our thanksgiving for his life and work, we recognize it was for you and for your glory Peter lived every day. We commend Wynne and their children, Tim and Becky and Dan, together with their spouses and their children to you. Please be to them the God of all comfort. May they know the nearness of your presence in the hours of loneliness and loss. Father, we thank you for all the happy memories we have of Peter. We praise you for the joy of knowing and loving him. Help us to look beyond our present sadness to the day when we will be reunited in your presence to enjoy the blessings of heaven forevermore. Receive our worship and our praise in the precious name of your lovely Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And remain standing as we sing that wonderful song in Christ alone.
to life, no fear in death. This is the love of Christ in me. From Christmas cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Peter's granddaughters, these are some words that Wynne wanted you to hear. I was 14 years old when I met Peter. He was in my life for nearly 58 years. We shared a wonderful marriage for 49 years, raised three amazing children, and doted over 10 grandchildren. At the end of his life, he suffered through 10 months of chemo, including on his 72nd birthday. That day, I wrote him a letter. Here are some of the words. You are and have been the most amazing husband, my best friend, mentor, encourager, role model. You make things happen. You are my home, my counselor. I've had the most amazing life experiences because of you. I'm in, in the process of writing these things down to make a, a book of our, of our stories. Your walk with God has been inspiring during these life-changing days with cancer. I love to hear you sing, and your prayers are truly a conversation and relationship with God. You provide for me constantly, and I feel protected. You brought me thousands of coffees to start the day. I thank God for you, my top blessing. Peter was authentic, the man that you no doubt heard preach from this pulpit or from thousands of others across the globe was genuine. He was the most selfless and generous human being I have ever known. He cared deeply for those in need and gave his energy, his time and his resources in service of others. He cared little for material possessions and held on to them very lightly. He was patient and considerate. He listened in a way that meant I always felt heard. His vast experiences and wide reading gave him great, great wisdom. So many people turned to him for help and advice. He was often physically absent, yet somehow he was always there for me and for our family, always there when we needed him. He was a truly wonderful husband, father, and granddad. On the night he died, he was at home. Almost the whole family were gathered, including Bex, from Canada in fa on FaceTime. We had sung together. I'm sure he was so silently harmonizing as he loved to do. Dan was re to return to Canada the next morning. His timing was perfect. We had all held him and said our goodbyes. He knew we would miss him. We did not fully appreciate just how much we would miss him. He was always writing, but rarely kept any sort of diary. Sorting through his mounds of papers after he died and longing to find anything personal, I came across one piece of paper with some words from a song that he noted down just before he died, now framed in the lounge. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, even so, I will trust. I will trust. 
I will trust in you. I also found a sentence in a rare journal in which he wrote that from his initial diagnosis of terminal cancer, he felt secure. Those words are now on his headstone, made from Honester Slate at the mine down Borrowdale where we love to walk. Thanks to all of you, throughout this journey, I have felt upheld by the prayers of God's people. Thank you so much for your love and support and for being part of this remembrance of his life. I miss him. Everyone here knew Dad. I'm going to tell you how I knew Dad. My dad was always there for us. He was constant. He was full of knowledge. If you ever needed to ask him something, he, he was always ready with an answer, and it was a, a really well-thought-out answer. He was full of God. You know, when I used to come down in the mornings from, for breakfast before school, he was always there reading his Bible. He called me Presh, or darling. He taught us how to be kind. He was always welcoming people into his home. He was always believing us. He was fighting for us, fighting for family, investing in it. He was generous. You know, one day he came to my house and he, he, he looked at the carpet and he said, darling, I'm going to buy you a new carpet. And we went that day and chose a carpet for our front room and he paid for it. You know, I remember, I remember him in Wales, we went caravanning and in the middle of the night, it was a huge storm. I remember dad going out in his jammers and holding on for dear life to the awning so that it wouldn't blow away off the cliff. And, you know, that was dad. He, was, he, he, he fought for things that were important. You know, he fought for family time and, you know, he was really busy, but he still made sure that, that we felt valued and loved. But if dad were here now, this is what he'd want us to say. He'd say, don't talk about me, talk about everyone else. Look what they've done. And that's true. None of this would have been possible without mum. Mum blocked out green family weekends on dad's calendar. Mum truly loved dad. And we all saw that every day of our lives. We saw her loving him. We saw them committed to each other. We saw what a really happy marriage should look like. So, Mum, thanks. You were the one who was, <laughs> when Dad was so busy, you were the one who was picking up the pieces and running with it and trying your best. And uh, Mum, we just want to say we love you and we really appreciate everything you've done. We appreciate how difficult this has all been and is still being. And we want to say we love you. Thanks, Mum. When Grandad retired, he was incredibly generous enough to spend his retirement gift on a trip to Disneyland with us. It was amazing and so selfless of him, but he ended up having a really good time, especially on the Tower of Terror. <laughs> Though I'm sure it wasn't his first choice of retirement holiday. I also remember how Grandad travelled all around the world and he would always bring us a little something back and I would enjoy listening to the stories of all the places in he had been that inspired me to travel and explore the world as he did. My Grandad was generous, funny and adventurous. Hi everyone, my name's Erin, I'm Peter's eldest granddaughter. I thought I would just tell you a quick story about Grandad that sprung to mind for me. So as you all know, Grandad had such a generous heart. I was always blown away by how generous he was in giving both money and time. So every time Grandma and Grandad came to Newcastle to visit us, us girls would drag Grandad to Ikea. Grandma's favourite place, but not so much for Grandad. Shopping was definitely not his favourite hobby. Nevertheless, he followed us up and down the aisles with a smile on his face as we shopped our hearts out. It was so cool to see how happy it made Grandad to see Grandma in the element. Grandad really valued family and was keen to spend time with us no matter what we were doing, despite his very busy work schedule. Then when we got to the tills in Ikea, he would be adamant that he would be paying for things here and there without any way of persuading him otherwise. 
granddad was such an, an amazing example to me and I really hope to mirror his generosity in my own life. I think most of the time granddad wasn't working at Keswick. He was playing crazy golf with me and even Hope Park, usually losing. He spent as much time as he possibly could improving others' lives. As much as possible he was with his family, having fun and giving love, while the rest of the time he was making a difference all over the world. My favourite memory of Grandad was when we went to Ray Castle and ate lunch. And it was so windy that our bags of chips flew away. My memory of him is when we went inside and went in one of the rooms, which had toys in it, like bricks, but they were cushion bricks. So we would make a house and Grandad would come and knock it down. So we would have to rebuild it. He kept on doing it and we would laugh so much. It was so fun. I will never forget that memory. I will always love him. Nothing will stop me. Hey, this is Joel out here in Italy. Just like to share my favorite memory of Grandad. It has to be the time that we visited Lake Windermere and he insisted on us taking a small motorboat around the lake. Bear in mind there were six of us and a dog, uh, but he wasn't taking no for an answer, so we all jumped aboard and headed off into the lake. It was a remarkably choppy day, uh, and he was uh, at the helm, uh, heading straight into some really big waves, and just this one wave went straight over the top of the boat and completely soaked us all. As you can imagine, he was absolutely loving it, but Grandma and the dog had their head between their knees. He was and still is a big role model in my life. I someday hope to be as great a man as he was, uh, just with a little more hair. Miss you, Grandad. One time, me and Grandma were sat in the awning at the Keswick Convention, whilst Grandad was getting ready to speak in the big tent. He came to the door to ask how he looked in strike to pose. I love that he never took himself too seriously. And he's wearing what he thought was a salmon pink shirt, but was actually Grandma's pink blouse. Of course, me and Grandma were in fits of laughter, and thankfully he went to get changed before speaking in front of thousands of people in Grandma's blouse. I also remember that Grandad used to play with me and all the grandchildren tirelessly, till we were laughing our heads off, whilst the other adults went in a different room and ignored us. Grandad was an amazing person, which sounds like a really simple way to describe him, but there's really no other way. He was patient, kind, generous, godly, the list goes on. He followed the Lord with all of his heart, mind, and soul, which has inspired me to do the same and is something that I will never forget. He was always so patient with me when I was little and was willing to play all of the games I used to make up. I was always amazed at how he agreed to do something with me when most people couldn't be bothered to. I will never forget how much he has inspired me to love the Lord. He was a true example of a follower of Jesus. I love Grandad so much, and he will forever be in my heart. Thank you, Grandad, for everything you did. Grandad was such a big part of my life. He was always there. At every little running race or school event, he'd always be there, and you could always tell how proud he was of you. All the little things, and I hope you knew how much that meant to all of us. When we were little, he used to make me laugh so much. We'd play games where we'd try and escape from being tickled on his knee and we'd had the best time. I miss him very much. One of my favourite memories of Grandad was when we went to the fair in Kendall and we went on the bumper car ride. I took over the steering wheel and we went so fast that his cap flew off and we rode over it. <laughs> we bumped into a lot of people and Grandad was just concentrating on apologising to him. But don't worry, we got his hat back. I also remember waking up in the morning to see Grandad sitting there, and I remember those precious moments I got to spend with him sitting there and talking. I love you, Grandad, and I miss you. I like coloring with Grandad. I'm my name's George Verrer. One of my greatest privileges in life was to meet and work together with uh, Peter Maiden. As I've been wrestling with what to uh, share, I kept somehow hearing Peter, who I had more communication with over 43 years approximately, except my own wife. Um, I'm hearing him say 
Thank you. Thank you for being here. I've been to Thanksgiving services of people who were quite significant and somehow not many people were able to be there. I happen to know there are thousands, this is not an exaggeration, thousands who would love to be here. They are all over the world because Peter Maiden had a phenomenal global ministry. And I, uh, to limit myself and my privileged time to share, I want to focus just more on what he did in connection with OM as the British director from around 1975, stepping into the shoes of Captain Graham Scott, <clears throat> who helped uh, pioneer the ship ministry. It's a bit emotional to be in this auditorium because last night I was in the Excel Center, which reminds me of this auditorium, but just twice as long, and listening to Franklin Graham preach the gospel. The son of the man, Billy Graham, who, if it wasn't for his faithfulness in preaching the gospel and people praying into that meeting, I surely would not be here as far as, humanly speaking, OM would not exist. And that takes us back to Mrs. Clapp, the praying woman. Some of you have seen the film about that. So I just give thanks for the great ministry of Keswick. I was one of the youngest persons to speak here back in the 70s when I was quite young and it was quite controversial and definitely got in trouble for my book reviews. <laughs> but my friends and many of you are friends that I pray for. Um, you would think I was ill if I didn't have some books. So uh, I know that Peter Maiden also was a book pusher, more subtle than my methods but he constantly was taking books with him. These, if you think you know Peter Maiden, uh, you actually probably don't. Because even though I had this close relationship all these years, 10 as British director, and then 23 or 24 as my associate director, of course, I was uh, here at Keswick in 2003. Many of you were here when we, uh, hand it over. People wonder, where's my global jacket? Peter Maiden got the global jacket. All I got left was a shirt. <laughs> and you can't even tell that it's a global shirt. I especially want to thank uh, those of you who have supported the work financially. Most people can't grasp what it is to recruit top trained people for leadership without offering them a salary. That is built into our system and culture. Only a few people have ever tackled it, and it's not wrong. It's just different. But Peter and Wynne Maiden, all their life, have trusted the Lord and raised their own support. Peter Maiden was a much greater fundraiser than you, he would ever appear. And some of his trips to North America and meetings with foundations, uh, the results were phenomenal. And so I want to especially thank any of you who have supported the work uh, or supported the Maiden family. And we've had some amazing support, especially from this great area known as Cumbria. And I also really want to thank you for your prayer ministry. If you've not been able to give, but you pray, that is equally or more important because of course we believe that we release funds through prayer. I would love to share so many different areas where in a, an amazing, unpredictable way, again and again, Peter Maiden, in our endless phone calls, meetings, and communication, uh, were like-minded. I don't think po most people understood because he was also such a dynamic local person, but I don't think most people grasped the task he took on when he became the international leader, and it's an honor to have Lawrence and Susan with us today, because the work was exploding and expanding. Immediately under his leadership, uh, after I stepped down in 2003, uh, he was out with the leaders purchasing this ship, which was quite controversial, and they were difficult days and difficult decisions for Peter 
in the years after that as it took so long to refurbish. But God has given us uh, from 2009 to this very moment a phenomenal ministry with Lagos Hope. And one of the greatest ways you can thank Peter Maiden for his life, his testimony, is joint operation mobilization. Hello? <laughs> he was a recruiter. And his more quiet method than mine, of course, was perfect for England. People that I turned off, Peter Maiden was able to turn on. He was also gifted at defending me. People who were upset with me would go to Peter and he would say, well, he, you know, he didn't really mean that. You know, that's part of his temperament. Uh, he gets excited. So, you know, why don't you join OM anyway? <laughs> I listened recently some months ago to an old tape in which Peter was sharing at a new recruits conference over in Belgium. And he shared stories about himself that I had never realized. And when you read his two latest books, Building on a Rock or Radical Gratitude, these are available at the reception place where we'll be gathering later. They are a gift. Please do not try to pay for them. You'll realize, and he would want me to say this, he was not a perfect person. We're all clay pots. We're all imperfect people. And I was able to share my struggles, my failures, my doubts um, with Peter. And he was such a gifted listener. And I just thank the Lord for his huge, huge influence in my own life. It's hard to evaluate things, but surely in the first 20 years of my life and before Peter came in, Dale Rotan was sort of, humanly speaking, the most important person next to my wife. But from 84, when Peter became my associate director, he became surely the most important person in my life, though I'm the kind of person that esteems everybody important. So we are here celebrating God's work through the gift of salvation, which Peter experienced at a very young age, which I did not experience until the Billy Graham meeting, March 3rd, 1955. Many people thought the transition would be difficult from 2003. People are constantly, even to this day, asking me, how am I doing? Uh, did I, how did I handle uh, transition? I can just tell you, tell you, my last 19 years were a lot better, humanly speaking, than the previous 19. So any of you who are getting older, I just turned 84, great things are ahead. There's no retirement program for kingdom people. Peter was an example of that. If I could push a button like they have in Star Trek and go to heaven and bring Peter back here, I would do it. But somehow, those of us who are still here we must take up this challenge. We must receive this legacy. And I think that includes taking time to read his books and really somehow receiving what Peter Maiden has given to the body of Christ. I'd like to just pray. Father, I thank you for the life, not just of Peter, but when Becky, Daniel, and Tim, their families, their grandchildren. I now have several years trying to memorize their names. And I just pray for greater things ahead. Hundreds of millions have still not even once heard the gospel. Many unreached people's groups do not have any churches. And we thank you that the mantle of Peter Maiden is now on Lawrence and Susan. And we know that they are carrying on this great vision, this impossible humanly speaking task. We thank you for 200,000 who have served with OM, over 25,000 from Britain alone. We thank you for hundreds of thousands that have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, for thousands of new churches that have been born, for hundreds of new ministries that trace their birth back to some OM team or someone like Peter Maiden visiting and ministering in their midst. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, man. Oh, man. We're going to rise to our feet and sing that song we were learning, What is Our Hope in Life and Death? Christ Alone. Christ alone. Let's rise to our feet. What is our hope? What is our hope in life? 
my pleasure and privilege to be able to say a few words um, about Peter from the perspective of Keswick Ministries. And I've drawn on the contributions of many others who've been serving with Keswick Ministries for much longer than I have been. I think one thing to say at the start that everyone highlighted, that to speak of Peter is to speak of win. And they themselves modelled in every way, as we've heard, but also in the service of the convention, the beautiful relationship of Christ and the church. Peter attended the convention from an early age with his parents. As a lifelong resident of Cumbria, he and Wynne have supported the convention for much of their lives. 
They've been amazing ambassadors, in fact, on behalf of Cumbria for the convention and on behalf of the convention to Cumbria. I just want to speak of a few different ways in which Peter and, of course, Wynne as well has contributed to Keswick Ministries. The first is a trustee and chair. So Peter was elected to the council and took up the chairmanship in September 2001. And he remained as chair until 2009, then as a trustee until 2012. And it was really his vision to develop from Keswick Convention to Keswick Ministries, to have a wider reach and a wider vision. So in many ways, what we're seeing now with this new site, the Doan Project, the development of teaching and training through the year, this is the part of the move from Keswick Convention to Keswick Ministries that was under Peter's watch. And as we, you don't need me to say, as we've heard, his leadership was characterized by amazing integrity and self-effacing humility. But he was also, of course, with a Keswick Convention and Keswick Ministries, a preacher. Many of us will know him best from that perspective, combining passionate, biblical, faithful preaching with a real-life application. His experience of global mission meant that there was a real breadth to his preaching. In 2011, as one trustee shared, he was giving the Bible readings on to Timothy. And he said to um, the trustee that he felt strangely inadequate as he gave these Bible readings. They were on to Timothy. And Peter said, um, well, it was John Stott who had given the Bible readings on to Timothy before. And the trustee thought, on the one hand, here was Peter's characteristic humility, but on the other hand, he thought this was very strange because Peter was speaking with such power and of effectiveness. And in one point on the Wednesday, Peter pointed out in the, from chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, unless we pass on the good news of Jesus Christ, we remain in debt. And Peter asked is there a debt crisis in the church? And then Peter was also a host to the evening celebrations. He was able to move seamlessly between light touch humor and to weighty calls to action. And I love these words from one fellow host who said this, I was so nervous at doing anything like that and his good humor and reassuring words put me at ease. It was so helpful to see that he got nervous before speaking and being willing to show his vulnerability and still serve has been a wonderful example to me. As well as the gentle banter we shared, he was never afraid to laugh at himself. I know we've heard this story already, but Wynne urged me to say it again. So you'll know that Peter and Wynne used to set up their caravan, caravan down by Derwent Water and the putting up of the awning was a legendary challenge. And then Peter, of course, before the evening celebrations, would head back down to the caravan to get changed and spruce himself up before the evening celebrations. And so, as we all know, he had a great penchant for pink shirts, if you see many of his photos. And of course, therefore, having spruced himself up and emerged from the shower, he was about to head out the door and he said to Win, how do I look? Well, said Wynne, you're wearing my pink blouse. <laughs> and of course, Peter told the story. Peter also wrote books, many books. And he wrote some books for Keswick Ministries. There's, of course, Discipleship Matters. And then his final book, during which cancer struck, Radical Gratitude. And that's an extraordinary book. The editor put it brilliantly. In the midst of the chemo, she said this, his emails were short, but always a joy and a blessing, outward focused and others centered, and unfailingly courteous, of course. His enthusiasm knew no bounds. Yes, I want to rewrite. Don't forget that I love rewriting. And yes, there was quite a bit of rewriting to do. But his books were Peter all over, Deep Authenticity, you knew you were hearing him and meeting him. And then, of course, there was also this passion for global mission we've heard so much about. His heart beat with a passion for global mission. 
And that made sure that the Keswick Convention, with its logo of hearing God's word, becoming like God's son, serving God's mission, had always that global perspective, whether it was in the prayer meetings or mission nights or wherever. He ensured that events' horizons were and remain broad. And then he was also a great ambassador for Keswick Ministries, Speaking around the place, as part of his concern for global mission, speaking around the place in Bible events around the UK and also around the world. But perhaps the biggest impact, you may have noticed there were six till now, the seventh and final one, is behind the scenes. Because in many ways it was behind the scenes, as we've heard, that Peter's impact was most extraordinary. It was the one-to-one conversations, the mentoring, the mediating, the stepping in, and again with that same humility. One of the things about organizing an event like this is the challenge of bringing speakers from all over the world. And on one occasion, one of the speakers' visas was being jeopardized. So you think, what do you do as an organizer? Do you wait and hope? Well, I went out to Peter and said, Peter... Um, we've got a preacher who may not be able to come here. Would you be willing to be stepping in as a sub? And he said, of course. And he said, and the preparation will do me good even if I'm not needed. And that was him all over, willing to step in as a team player or to step away from that. Or as one trustee said, always willing to speak to anyone, do anything to help serve, to check how people were getting on, and to thank people for their work. He was equally happy preaching on the main platform, giving an individual counsel, or hoovering the creche and cleaning toilets. That was Peter. We miss dear Peter. We thank the Lord for him. And we know that he'd be saying, dressed in his pink shirt, to God be the glory. Hello, Wynne, family and friends of Peter. It's such an honour to join you in remembering Peter's life and legacy today. My name is Catherine and together with my husband Lloyd, we've served with OM for over 32 years and we have loved encountering Peter and Wynne many times in our journey with OM. It was wonderful when they came to visit us here in Western Australia, where Peter ministered richly to many people from God's word as he did all over the world. He also, much to the delight of our two young daughters, donned a tutu to entertain them. It was a wonderful family memory, and I have photos. (laughs) The second deep and abiding memory Lloyd and I share is when Peter and Wynne came to Russia to speak at our spring campaign. It was a very cold spring in Russia. They slept on a classroom floor. The toilet situation was less than desirable and it was cold everywhere we went. Peter and Wynne ministered to people consistently. Peter taught richly from God's word as he always did. And the young Russians were so hungry to learn from him. I recall him being followed everywhere, including places perhaps he would prefer not to have been followed by people who were just desperate to hear from him and to learn more about God from him. That remains one of my abiding memories of Peter, teaching God's word surrounded by people hungry to learn. My other personal memory of that time is, doesn't reflect quite so well on me. I took Peter and Wynne for a final day of sightseeing around St. Petersburg and somehow managed to walk them into the middle of a giant lake of ice water. Peter looked down at his own soaking wet, thin English brogues and at my sturdy Russian boots, which were quite dry. And then he looked up at me and said, there's nothing for it, Catherine. We'll have to swim out. (laughs) Oh, Peter, how richly we miss you and how we treasure the legacy you've left. Thank you for ministering to so many people. Thank you for living a life fully committed to Jesus. We honour your legacy today, as do many people around the world. And we're so grateful to have loved and known you. Morning, Peter. What will it be? Toast and tea as usual? That was the fair at Tea Bay truck stop between Penrith and Kendall, where we used to meet. Then we uh, must have had an increase in our pension because in Carnforth Truck Haven, we chose our five breakfast specials and splurged. 
My turn to pay? Oh, those truck stop breakfasts were just very, very encouraging. Very special time that uh, I used to spend with him, and they were unforgetting, unforgetting uh, meeting points. There were great occasions because his fellowship, his center upon the word, his insights, his understanding of the world was second to none. He was warm and thoughtful, straightforward, calm and unhurried. He had time, though a very full diary. Having already passed on his OM responsibilities, I very much valued his advice as I also went into the process of succession. In his own quiet way, he advised without being pushy, and hence his counsel got to the point and warranted the action he suggested. You know, many others, as we've already heard, benefited from his counsel and his mentoring, which is a role that I believe he relished and saw in his investment in leaders, of which there are many will say thank you to him. I think of Paul when he said of Timothy, I have no one else, him, like him, who takes genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And Peter certainly looked out for the interest of Jesus Christ. His connection with Cape and Ray goes back many years to a time when he used to take in the 70s groups to various torchbearer centers and so subsequently spoke at summer weeks, particularly the family weeks uh, back then. And it was a clear content of his message that captured people centered in Christ and very much practical. He had a personable demeanor and a practical approach to life and encouragement. It was great that he maintained his Cumbrian <clears throat> accent uh, or his touch and his particular sense of humor from the north. He reflected a true humility without being condescending. And he was never less than comfortable in any situation. Well, that's how it appeared. He seemed to handle situations and opportunities so well. Well, perhaps um, <clears throat> there are weaknesses, but you'll have to talk to Wynne about those. But I'm sure she won't give you any. It was through Cry Charles Price that he came and began to speak at Teacher Cape and Ray. And uh, he soon shared his world knowledge, his wisdom and his desire for evangelism to reach the world and see that encouraging students to share life through their being and through the message of the gospel. We're sorry, so very grateful that when he handed over the reins of OM, he then took on a responsibility at Cape and Ray Board, and he was a stabilizing influence. He handled difficulties well and assessed situations thoughtfully. His participation was highly valued and he played a vital part amongst us and applied needed wisdom direction when he faced the transition of leadership, both nationally and internationally. And he spoke five years ago at our international staff conference and it was poignant, practical and very helpful, just the perfect timing for us. Win and family, I speak for myself and I know for many others, Cape and Ray included, to thank you for sharing him with us, so many others around the world. And my, radi my radical gratitude that he spoke about grip our hearts in Christ. Personally, I won't forget toast, tea, and truck stops. Good afternoon, Saints. My name is Francois Bosse from South Hi, Africa. Sir. Good to see you. Thank you for this big privilege to be part of today's celebration of Peter's life. There is not a week that passes that I do not think of Peter. Like so many of you, I miss him. I miss his friendship. I miss the way that he shared his walk with God with us. I miss his great sense of humor. I miss seeing him with Winifred, enjoying the children and grandchildren that they loved so much. I miss his calls just to hear how we are doing. I miss his magnificent Bible teaching. I miss our traveling together through the bushes of Africa to visit the least reached and just his interest in all our workers that is working there. I miss our times of praying together and asking God for the impossible. Proverbs says that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. 
I miss my friend and brother Peter so much. But now it is our time to be that friend to others. It's our time to take over the baton from him. May God bless you today and the light in you during this time. Well, friends, I'm the one who's now standing between you and tea. And I'm going to be as short as I can be, because if we run on too late, I'm going to be the one who gets the blame, right? So would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord, thank you for being at this amazing time together. And in these final moments of a Thanksgiving service for a life so well lived, we pray for your grace to hear your word, that it may help us, strengthen us, encourage us, like Peter, to keep going for the glory of you, our God. Amen. Well, we are heading for tea time, and I want to give you tea time today. A verse in Psalm 30 says this, verse 5. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may tarry or remain for the night, but joy comes with the morning. I have three T's to summarize today. The first is simply this, tears. Weeping may remain for the night. One of my close friends has recently been trying to get a letter published with his uh, medical background in the Times newspaper explaining how many of his young medical colleagues do not know any longer, it seems, how to handle the issue of death. And when we look around our secular society today that in one way and another tells us that we live in a totally random, purposeless, meaningless universe, what do you do when tragedy, heartbreak, and death comes? Of course, very often folk uh, hear those words from uh, Mary Elizabeth Fry's 1932 poem, do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there, I do not sleep, I am a thousand winds that blow, I am the diamond glints on snow, and so on and so forth. I am the soft stars that shine at night, do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there, I did not die. Well, I've got some bad news for you, you did. People die, and Christians die. And what's to be the Christian reaction in the face of death? And there are some bland Christians who say, oh, why are you, you, you crying today? I mean, after all, Peter's now gone to be with Jesus in heaven, and we all need to just throw a big party and have a great big time and say, he's fine. And that's to ignore the utter reality of death. That's why right throughout the Old Testament, there are all these concerns of death and what leads to it, suffering and sorrow and tears and setbacks and disease because this is not how life was meant to be. We were created to know God and enjoy Him forever and then death comes and it seems so inconvenient. You try to live your life and there was Wynne and Peter I know looking forward to so many years together and we often say it was the grim reaper. Really? I don't know how it all pans out, and anybody who tells you they do, you know they're just blowing hot air. We don't know the secret purposes of our Father in heaven. One day we will. We see now through a glass darkly. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. What I am doing now, says Jesus, you do not know, but you shall know hereafter. And if we don't understand a little bit further down the road, there is a great hereafter. And that's why when death comes, as Christians, we are allowed to mourn. We're allowed to weep. The shortest verse in the old King James Version is what? Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. 
And that's why the psalmist says, tears may remain for the night. Have you ever noticed after Stephen's martyrdom, at the end of Acts 7, that he's crying out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And you think, oh, that's great, he's gone to heaven. And just read on a verse or two into chapter 8, and it says, Godly man came and made great mourning over Stephen's death. They didn't say, hey, well, you know, he's gone to heaven. He's having a great time up there, you know. I don't know. We're just going to join the party down here on earth, right? Scripture says we do not grieve, not full stop, but as others who have no hope. We do not grieve because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in Him shall never ultimately die. But grieve we do. And that's why Scripture elsewhere says if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For for this reason Christ died and rose again, that He might be the Lord of the living and the dead. Nevertheless, this is our time for tears. It's also our time for thanks. His favor lasts a lifetime. We'll all have our particular memories of Peter, some of us more personal than others. Many of us who've just sat under his ministry, had him at our churches, maybe had him in our homes. And I don't want to take really any time to be too sort of uh, autobiographical, although it's about 40 years from when I first met Peter. And then I remember an occasion when he said to me, as a young preacher, he was in the presence of that great 20th century preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Martin Lloyd-Jones asked him what he did, and he said, well, he preached and he administrated. And Lloyd-Jones, who was a preacher and not an administrator, said, and I can hear Peter telling me, well, you've got to choose one or the other, my friend. <laughs> but Peter didn't choose one or the other. He, he organized and he agonized, he preached, and he made things happen. He wasn't a one-trick pony. And I can remember other occasions in my life where I've seen him. I had the privilege of spending time with him and Wynne just a few months from his death when I was in the UK, traveled up to Cumbria. And what a lovely, delightful time as he was in the valley of the shadow of death because we've been friends in the Keswick Council for many years, and don't try this with people you don't know. Just not long before he died, I was chatting to him, and he was so confident the gospel has done its work. And then he said, hey, Steve, I've just taken delivery of my last book, 10 copies. I said, oh, that's fantastic, Peter. You know what you've got to do, don't you? He said, what? I said, you've got to personally sign them. Why? I said, because an artist's work is always worth more when he's dead than he's alive. <laughs> he thanked me so much for the encouragement. <laughs> but you see, you can do that in the face of death when you know Jesus Christ. You can do that when you know where you're going. You can do that when you enter the box junction of death where it says, do not enter till your exit's clear, when you know you have the assurance of life everlasting in Christ. And so today, though we mourn and we shed our tears, we give thanks for a brother beloved and a brother who's in Christ and from whom not even death itself can separate us. And the great glory of the Christian faith is the best is always yet to be and there'll come a wonderful day when heaven will be an eternal hello and no more goodbyes again. We treasure up all the great memories of a, a brother beloved and a family member, uh, the man he was because of Wynne, and all the input that his children, his grandchildren made into his life. We say, Lord, thank you for Peter Maiden today. And finally, it's a time for trust. Weeping may tarry, may remain for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. That's always how it is with our God. I'm sure you've noticed many times when the Lord created the heavens and the earth, there was evening and there was morning. There was evening and morning. That's why the Sabbath runs from the evening to the morning, not from the morning to the evening. When folk don't have faith, they start in the morning of life and they get to high noon and the good days 
And then as the shadows begin to fall, when they're getting old, you know, when they're 25 or something, but more seriously, as the shadows begin to fall and then they enter in to that dark period, do not go gentle into that good night, said Dylan Thomas. Old age should burn and rave at close of day, rage, rage against the dying of the light. But that can't be the Christian perspective because Christians don't go from the morning to the evening and then good night. We go from the evening to the morning. Well, looking forward to the eternal day when the Son of God who died for us and rose again and ever lives for us will come again in power and glory and make all things new. And that's why today is a time for trust. When's God going to turn it all around and make it all clear? I don't know. You don't know. But Scripture says this, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. When uh, we eventually put together the epitaph for my wife's grave, nearly five years ago now, uh, there were just three pithy phrases I wanted on it with a scripture verse. The verse was from Mark 14, she did what she could. Peter Maiden did all he could for Jesus. And then three pithy phrases that summed up her life and many Christians and certainly Peter Maiden's. In Christ, for Christ, with Christ. Here was a life that found Christ and salvation in him, that lived for Jesus with no punches pulled and is now with him. Can I ask you, have you got that relationship personally with God? That when your time to go comes, will folk be speaking confidently of you or with fingers crossed as we say, hoping that maybe your burial or your cremation will be in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life? Because Peter knew where he was going. Some of his last words were to me and to others, the gospel has done its work. Down in Zenner in Cornwall, there's an epitaph on a grave that says, O traveler, as thou passest by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. So traveler, prepare to follow me. Well, thanks for the encouragement. Somebody scribbled in chalk underneath, to follow you, I'd be content if I just know, knew the way you went. We know the way Peter went. Make sure you've surrendered to Christ, you're trusting him as Lord and Savior, and you know one day, folk will speak of you with confidence if the Lord tarries, and knowing where you are, because in Jesus Christ, we have a Lord who loves us in life and will never lose us in death till we see him and all the redeemed face to face. Amen. May from our morning to our evenings, may we be found to be in the Lord and blessing his holy name. Let's rise to our feet as we sing, bless, bless the Lord, O my soul.
Please do take a seat. I think in uh, some parts of the world, at an event like this, when people, especially family members and others, have given such wonderful tributes, uh, we would probably make a little more noise than we have this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to suggest that an expression of thanks to all those who've contributed, but also our praise to the Lord, we applaud. Amen. Well, it's been wonderful to have so many here at the tent and others watching. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. <clears throat> We're going to close our service in just a moment, but before we do so with a word of prayer, uh, just a few announcements, if I may, to uh, help us as we conclude the service. Uh, the first thing is to say that uh, there will be a Thanksgiving offering, and you'll notice at the end of the service sheet the details uh, for this Peter Maiden Memorial Fund. Um, any funds which are given will be split equally between Operation Mobilization and Keswick Ministries. And the uh, guidance on how you can give online or by check is found at the bottom of your service sheet. It would be wonderful if, as an expression of our gratitude today, uh, thousands of pounds could be released for the benefit of the work of OM and Keswick Ministries. So please do bear that in mind. If you are writing a check, you can place those in the uh, uh, boxes which are at the exits. Uh, the second thing to mention is that we're enormously grateful to Keswick Ministries for allowing us to use this venue, which has been so appropriate for a Thanksgiving service for Peter's life. Um, but they moved quite quickly to another event after this has finished, so could we please ask that uh, we move out of this main tent as soon as is convenient, and we'll carry on our conversations outside in the open air or over at base camp. Thank you for your kind consideration in doing that. Uh, the other thing to mention is that there is a, a reception. Those of you who have been invited to attend the reception, please would you follow the signs to that venue as soon as uh, we close, uh, after we close in prayer. Um, we would love to have had everybody attend that reception, but sadly space is very limited 
Uh, so we regret to say that's by invitation only. But there is a way in which we can all contribute, and that is that with your order of service, you may have received a small blank card. And Wynne would be very grateful if we could add our names onto that card and a greeting if you would like, uh, and pop it into the uh, offering boxes as you leave. Wynne will then have a record of everyone who was present. Um, I will defend her by saying she will not necessarily reply to everyone, but if you want to add your name and a little message to Wynne, please do that as you leave. Well, now we're going to close with prayer together, and the psalm on which uh, Steve spoke very briefly, Psalm 30, includes within it a phrase, Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. And so we're going to say three short prayers around the three things that Steve has brought to our attention, and we're going to follow what some churches do. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and we will together reply, hear our prayer. Shall we do that after each of the short prayers as we draw to a close now? Let's pray. Dear Father, today we've been reminded that we have so much to be thankful for. We are thankful for your grace in bringing Peter into your family and equipping him to serve you all around the world. We are so thankful for his loving care for others as a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, and a good friend. We are thankful for Peter's example of humility and servanthood, his generosity to others, his wisdom, and his wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord. And as we express our gratitude, dear Father, we ask that we may resolve to do the same, to devote our lives to the service of others, to trust your empowering spirit to make us like Jesus and to live our lives for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Father, today we've been reminded that our human response is rightly one of tears and sadness. And we pray for those who feel the loss of Peter's companionship most keenly. We thank you that you are the compassionate Father who understands our grief and sorrow. And so we pray for the continuing comforting presence of your spirit and the encouragement of your promises of resurrection life. In due time, as Psalm 30 reminds us, please remove the sackcloth and clothe us with joy. And we pray for your special care for the family, for dear Wynn, for Becky and Jew, and their children Erin, Joel, and Attie, for Tim and Hannah, and their children Lily, Jonah, and Eve, for Dan and Bex, and their children, Indy, Shyla, Cassie, and Willow. And for Peter's brothers and sister, Brian, Michael, and Gwyn. We ask you, Lord, to surround them with your fatherly love, comfort them in their loss, and encourage them in the knowledge of Peter's life well lived and his life now with you. And may children and grandchildren follow in Peter's steps which were so firmly planted in the footsteps of Jesus himself. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And dear Father, we have also heard your word of encouragement to trust you fully. We know the fragility of human life, the uncertainty of the world in which we live, and the waywardness of our own hearts. So we thank you for reminding us that you are the God who protects and delivers, the God who redeems through Jesus Christ, the God who is ready to help in time of need. We ask that you will strengthen our trust in you, the loving Father and Sovereign Lord. For family members greatly missing Peter's support, help us to trust you for your care and companionship. For those of us in OM, Help us to trust you for the global task of mission. For those of us in Keswick Ministries or Cape and Ray, help us to trust your word to fulfill its purposes and promises. For all of us in everyday discipleship, 
Help us to trust you for all the resources we need in this uncertain world. And for any here who have burdens on their shoulders or fear in their hearts, may the love of the Father surround us, the grace of Christ renew us, and the fellowship of the Spirit empower us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring all our prayers to you, knowing that you are the compassionate and forgiving Father, who through your Son defeated death, took upon himself our sins, opened the door to eternal life, and by his Spirit has given us inexhaustible grace to help in time of need. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Through every trial, the ageless rock. 